Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to our summer season. Um, this is the first talk post Easter. Uh, I hope you all got lots of eggs. Um, it's a lovely sunny evening, and I suspect some of you uh, are already sitting in the garden. And we were saying just now, one of the delights of modern technology is that rather than having to go to a dingy old lecture theater, you can actually sit in the garden and have the pleasure of a lecture. Uh, uh, and I'm sure this evening it will be a pleasure because we've got uh, Professor Cecilia Mascolo, who's going to talk to us about um, the whole business of wearable uh, technology and analysis um, of healthcare, something that could hardly be more appropriate in the rather difficult times uh, we've been through. Um, I'm delighted to welcome Professor Cecilia Mascolo. Uh, she's Professor of Computer Science in the University of Cambridge, uh, focusing on how you use wearable devices uh, for healthcare diagnosis. Uh, as I say, it could hardly be a more topical topic. Professor Mascolo, please. Thank you very much for the introduction and for the invitation. Um, I will proceed to share the screen and I will look forward to your questions. Um, so, um, so this talk is really about uh, my general research. So in the first part, I will uh, talk about what we do in general, try to motivate it a bit. And then I'll focus on a specific project, which is um, reasonably uh, timely uh, given it's COVID related. And um, it's about using the audio that comes from devices that we, we carry around with us to uh, understand if we can diagnose. So uh, first, a little bit of con context here. Um, I am a computer scientist and uh, I work on uh, trying to understand how to improve systems and how to improve the, the data analysis uh, of the data that comes out of this mobile and wearable systems. So uh, we use these devices to, uh, and, and the sensors to try to sense people's behavior, understand people's behavior and behaviors that is often difficult to sense. So here are some examples of things that we want to improve. Sometimes to understand someone's behavior, you need some sort of continuous input. And, and doctors, for example, find it difficult to gather continuous input per, because perhaps they see the person uh, fairly irregularly. So giving them this sort of input in other means, uh, through other means is useful. Or perhaps, uh, and using sensing um, behavior that requires often the user to input something uh, or uh, answer a questionnaire regularly to tell them perhaps how they feel, how their mood is. Um, and that's quite, require quite a bit of attention um, and quite um, important you know, memory aspects for the user to remember to fill in the questionnaire and actually fill it, all right, how, how many times have you done X today? It's difficult to remember, right? Sometimes we have sensing techniques that are quite expensive, require um, expensive equipment, and we're trying to make it cheaper. I'm sure you've seen talks before. I saw in the list of talks that we had uh, other engineers showing you how they um, devised new types of sensing that can be better or uh, you know, more precise or even uh, perhaps more scalable and cheaper, more affordable. And sometimes the sensing is invasive. Um, so to get that information, uh, you need to operate onto the body, um, you know, have invasive techniques or um, operations. Oh, sometimes the sensing could be dangerous. So we're trying to find solution, alternative solution. So the first thing I'm gonna do is give you an example. Is if, you, if we were in a real audience at this point, I would ask how many of you had um, this quite difficult fitness test that's sometimes given to, to people to understand how fit they are. It requires you to go um, on a bike or on a treadmill and wear a, a mask and breathe really heavily. And really you're pushed to the extreme levels of your uh, fitness uh, to understand um, you know, your, your level of fitness. And the proxy for that information is a value called VO2 max, which is the value of oxygen that uh, you breathe through the lungs and, and transferred into energy in your muscles when you exercise. Um, researchers have since um, found ways to approximate um, this, to um, have a fitness test that goes beyond uh, this laboratory test. And one way in which they approximate it is to um, use simple demographics of the person, 
And in addition, ask questions about um, how many times the person exercised per week, and um, they use uh, a measure of uh, resting heart rate um, of the person. And um, also since then, uh, wearable devices are starting to appear that uh, try to already approximate this VO2 max uh, measurement. If you have an Apple phone, an Apple watch, you would um, find that information is recorded already. And it's approximated through um, whenever you use the device for exercise, uh, that's when that information is gathered and, and assessed. However, um, you know, as researchers, um, both in Apple and outside Apple, in fact, even in my team, we're trying to push the boundaries and go even further and try by um, using sensors um, on these devices um, while you wear them in your daily life without telling the device anything, can we find proxy measures for this, uh, this fitness um, idea on, on the um, lower uh, quadrant of, um, on the right, uh, you see a graph of one of our latest attempt to measure this VO2 max. Uh, this is not work that we've published yet, but it's just an indication. As you can see, there's a distribution of people and um, the values of VO2 max. We tend to um, underestimate the VO2 max. Uh, the blue values are a bit shifted more um, to the right than the pink values without the predictive values. So I don't want to really talk more about that. This was just an example of um, how you can, uh, you know, you can think of more difficult things that we can go and approximate. Um, the more the, the the next general aspects I wanted to discuss was the fact that yes, we are talking of phones, we are talking of wearables uh, that are already in the pockets of, um, of many uh, people around the world. Um, but uh, our job is also trying to think of other devices, coming up devices, the one that I'm wearing in my ear, for example, on the screen, um, are an example of a new device that some of my colleagues are defining as the next generation smartphone, because it's going to really shift um, the, the use of, uh, of what, what wearable is and uh, what it can do. And so they're, they're thinking of all the possible sensors. The phone factor here is an issue because you can't have many things on that. Energy, are these devices standalone? Are they depending on other devices? Uh, what kind of microphone? What kind of other, other things you can put in here? And what, most importantly, what can you do with it? The other question that I will um, ask, I would like to um, put out of the way before we go further in the talk is a question on uh, privacy, which is often the elephant in the room. Um, you know, uh, for, for our research, trying to understand people's behaviors from uh, data coming from flight, uh, personal devices uh, is um, obviously asking a question, a bigger question of, you know, where is the data going? Uh, what are we doing with it? So as I research in computer science, I research into systems. So with my system hat on, I can say that uh, we are devising solutions by which the computation of the behavior can very much stay close to the user, close to the data, the tower of the user, perhaps even on the device itself or very close or a, a, a very nearby device to the user. In order to do that, um, for, for researching this, um, I'm, I'm giving you a metaphor here, um, a medical metaphor. So when we have um, clinical trials for drugs, the first version of the drug that goes on the clinical trial is one that has some side effects. So often in my research, we collect data for behavior and we build models. We, we build understanding of behavior and we do it from data that is uh, from, from people that are subscribing to this clinical trial. So giving us the data for research. But then our aim is to develop models that when they go out and scale out to the population, uh, so when the drug is ready, uh, it won't have that side effect. It will be a drug, it will be a model, it'll be a, be a behavior sensing that uh, will stay with the user and will not leak data out, will not um, have the side effect of everyone getting the data to do the analysis. So I can talk more and you can ask me a question on this, but this is my take. It's a very simplistic take. There are other questions that can be asked. But it's, it's a take on privacy that you might bear in mind while um, I talk about this thing. So for the rest of the talk, I will try to concentrate on um, a set 
of uh, projects that deal with the use of microphones of sound for uh, diagnostics. Now, the, the ability of sound to uh, help diagnostic of disease has uh, two advantages uh, that you can somehow metaphorically see in these two pictures. And the first picture uh, represents the fact that microphones are very cheap devices already and they're embedded in a number of um, devices themselves that are with us most of the time. So they are affordable and scalable. The second property is that uh, by staying with the user can offer a continuous sensing ability, which is something I talked, the first thing I talked about uh, at the start of my talk, uh, the fact that it can give you a continuous signal about the user and therefore they can do better than um, a, a sporadic or discrete um, signal or sensing that can be done perhaps clinically through um, auscultation or other um, mechanism to get that information from the user. So we're not new to using um, microphones to understand behavior. This is a paper from 2010, in fact, where we did a non-device emotion sensing system on a very, a very old Nokia phone, the brick phones, the ones that had a very good battery. And um, we were using the sound, so the, the, the phone had a, a sort of model that was trained on actor voices or actors playing different uh, emotions. And then when the user was um, you know, talking either in the phone or simply being with the user um, together, um, they would be able to detect the voice emotions features in the, in the, in, in the voice of the user and understand it. Since uh, then, um, a number of approaches, this is a, a MIT tech review uh, report in 2017, which said that voice features could be used to diagnose diseases and examples that were given in the article were post-traumatic stress disease or even heart disease. Heart disease because um, voice, the voice and respiratory apparatus, um, when certain heart diseases occur, harden and uh, change the way in which the voice is emitted. And uh, therefore you could, by considering uh, sound of the voice, also um, understand some other cardiac pathologies. This is not my work, this is work I'm citing um, of other people. Another work I like to cite is um, this one where um, these people collected um, 999 calls a voice and they tried to uh, build a machine learning model to understand um, elements of cardiac arrest. So this agonal breathing, which is a biomarker, um, they, they tried to the collect, so understand, you create models that understood that. And they went a little bit further for those uh, more uh, perhaps computer science inclined, they tried to add noise to the 999 calls and imagine that this data could come out to smart devices such as our um, smart home devices, Alexa or Google Home. Uh, so they tried to simulate that by using the data they had and show that this could be done in a more robust way in an environment where this could be voice coming out of our home devices. Voice is not the only thing that can be heard. Um, Auscultation of our bodies um, have been going on for centuries, and it's a very cheap and very effective way of listening to um, heart and lungs and other parts of the bodies as well. However, auscultation um, clinically is going is, is, is slowly being substituted by other ways, uh, more automatic ways of doing it. This is an echocardiogram now often is uh, the way in which um, diagnostics of heart murmurs uh, is done. This is because listening to the heart is actually uh, quite difficult. Um, it's, uh, it's a skill that it takes time for a human ear to establish. Um, however, you know, auscultation can be done everywhere. Um, scans are a bit more difficult to carry around and to uh, operate. So that's an interesting um, aspect to consider there. Then I, I was talking to um, a respiratory clinician and uh, I was asking them how they train their doctors. And um, they were telling me that um, essentially this happens 
mostly by uh, listening to the same patients in the same room. So I listen first, I tell you what I hear, then you listen as well, and this is how they train. They have limited data sets of exemplar of um, clinically, well, clean sounds of uh, you know, heart murmur or a certain kind of uh, lung pathologies. But this is not done in large scale. So they don't have big data banks of sounds of body. Um, it, it, it's usually one-to-one -one training. Uh, with the doctor, so you learn this skill. And it's a, in this particular case, it's quite a difficult skill to learn, as you can imagine, or maybe perhaps you know more about this than me. So um, I have started uh, a, a large project uh, that goes beyond uh, what I'm going to talk more precisely uh, in the rest of the talk today. But the idea here is to really collect large in the wild data sets, because the data sets I was talking about, about sounds and um, that exist are really very clean. Uh, a few sounds of each um, disease in one specific condition. Uh, they're not like how one would really listen to uh, in the wild. So the idea would be to collect a database of this kind of sounds that could be used for various things. One of what the the place where I'm going with this is, of course, trying to automate the diagnostic or help the automation of the diagnostic via uh, machine learning and using these data sets. Then, of course, we need models that are robust to the fact that possibly this data comes out uh, from devices that are with us. So there is a lot of noise there. There, there, there are conditions which are not uh, clean and, 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 and clinical. Um, we want to look at screening. So can we screen a, a, a general pathology of um, of, of this disease? Can we really classify the specific features of the disease? Can we then look at progression or can we then look at emergency situations where we can say, okay, this person now needs to go to hospital? This is kind of the, the various tasks or question that the models might be want to answer. And then of course, because I talked about privacy, I, I'm interested in seeing the on-device aspect, trying to keep um, everything um, on device and not let the data leak anywhere else, integrate various sensors, look at continuous monitoring. And one aspect on which I have one slide at the end is the interpretability. So they're looking at the relationship between um, the, uh, the machine learning automatic aspect and the clinical and how they can live together and actually help each other because uh, one possibly, certainly the modeling is not enough by itself, not this day at least. So while I started this project, um, this uh, was a year and a half ago when this five years project started. We were starting to look at uh, cardiovascular aspects, so auscultation of the heart and trying to collect data sets on that. And then COVID happened and um, COVID, um, well, we know COVID is, uh, is not a respiratory disease as far as I understand, but it has some very severe respiratory implications. And this is a review that was uh, published um, a little while back about the ability of a sound analysis, machine learning based sound analysis to give classification and detection of various diseases. Examples that you can already read in the abstract are COPD, asthma, and even pneumonia. So there is a history of ability of using sounds from the body to detect a disease. Now in this particular case, um, this particular overview was mainly based on auscultation. So um, sounds that were coming directly from the lungs. Um, and um, we have um, started something slightly different, uh, but there are other approaches I'm, I'm going to talk about. So here, um, a colleague of mine called me up and said, hey, you have this big project on audio. How about we try it on, on COVID and see what we, what we can do? And together with two other researchers in Cambridge, uh, we pushed out an app. Um, so a mobile phone app that was collecting sounds from people who wanted to give sounds to us. So I'll explain in a minute what the app does. Uh, it has been difficult to push such an app out in such as, uh, a very short time last year. March was a very difficult month for me. Uh, and then in April, we came out with this app. Um, if you go on that URL, you find more details of the study, but I hope to give you enough uh, by the end of the talk. So these are three screenshots of um, how the app works. Um, so the app um, first asks you to um, insert information about your medical history, uh, your symptoms, if you have any, 
if you had a te COVID test, so if you've been tested um, and what the result of that was, and then it does something that goes beyond what other uh, normal questionnaire-based apps are doing, which is it asks for um, data from your breathing, your cough, and your voice. And it does that by asking you to breathe five times, cough three times, and read a screen, uh, a sentence on the screen three times. So um, why would we want this sort of data? Well, the idea, the, the holy grail of the whole uh, idea here is to develop models that um, can be used to uh, automatically understand if someone has COVID or how that COVID is progressing, in fact. Uh, the advantage of doing it on a phone are, um, are many. Um, the, the, the idea could be scalable. Many people have a, a phone. Um, it's contactless, which for such an app, uh, for such a disease is important. It's obviously affordable and can be repeated uh, very many times without any implication, apart from your voice, perhaps if you do it too much, you cough too much. So uh, for those more, uh, graph inclined, there are just some um, small graphs of the growth and the distribution of the demographics of the users. Um, we have um, more than uh, 30,000 users. So this was a year collection, um, 60,000 samples. So, so this is a crowdsource, really very, very um, uncontrolled. Um, we had people not submitting the right um, audio, of course, we, you know, we had to sanitize some of the data. This is the participant age distribution. This is uh, the location of the participants. The big none there is because they allow people to not tell us where they are, obviously. Um, so there was a, a big com campaign in Italy. So we have lots of Italian users, uh, many UK and United States uh, users as well. Here's uh, the many questions we ask about uh, if they tested positive or not. Um, when they tested, have they passed, tested, not tested, negative tested. So lots of little questions about their testing status, which we use as ground truth to test our models. We, we trust the users and, and say, well, you know, um, have you tested positive recently? Then um, yes, we, you know, that, that sort of data should be different from other data. One thing I like to use here is the distribution of symptoms uh, that are reported among those that report symptoms, among the negative and positively tested, at least what, what they say, they're positively and negatively tested. And as you can see, um, loss of smell and taste is really a good indicator, of course. But if you look at dry cough, wet cough, runny nose, sore throat, the numbers are fairly similar. So we're saying here that, that somehow symptoms might not quite just be enough to, 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 to be an indication um, sometimes. And we know, we know that uh, that's true. So again, to um, lead you more into where we're going with this, um, this is a spectrogram of the audio. So this is a picture of the frequency distributions of the audio over time of three cuffs. As you can see, the three images um, inside, you know, it's two boxes, two spectrograms, but the healthy cuff has three uh, lines, vertical lines where we see them. And um, the same for the COVID cough, except that um, you see the healthy cough is a bit more uh, tidy, I would say. Um, the vocal fold uh, movements at the end of each cough are, are visible in the, in, the, um, in the spectrogram of the healthy cough. They're not visible in the COVID cough. And the, there's energy distribution of, over the frequency, high frequency as well. So it's all green at the top as well. So um, they, they look very different. Obviously, it, it's just an indication and uh, there's nothing more here. And this is about the voice. Um, the harmonics and formants of the voice, uh, you see all those little waves, you see them very well in the healthy cough, you don't see them so well in the COVID cough. And again, um, high frequency um, aspects coming up. I'm putting at the bottom two papers that I found really interesting by a colleague in CMU, Rita Singh. And she has uh, looked at these aspects of the voice and found um, some specific features of COVID-19 voices that could um, indicate, could, could be different from healthy voices. And 
um, this is something that uh, perhaps if you are really interested, you could, if you Google her, you will find her on the web page. And, and just because it's an evening talk, um, I also want to uh, make you hear two samples of um, a female, a Portuguese female. I have slightly modified the audio because uh, we, we get cross data, uh, but voice can be re-identified. So because I, I, you know, we want to be anonymous, I have um, unidentified the voice. And uh, the first one is uh, uh, when, when she was sick, and the second voice is when she recovered, and you will hear quite a considerable difference in the two samples. So I'm playing them. Eu espero que os meus dados possam ajudar a controlar essa pandemia. Eu espero que os meus dados possam ajudar a controlar. And then when she recovered. Eu espero que os meus dados possam ajudar a controlar essa pandemia. Eu espero que os meus so, uh, I mean, I obviously pick one that was very different and um, it's impressive and I'm, I'm glad to see she recovered. So uh, one thing I haven't mentioned is that our participants can um, give the readings, not just once, but every, every couple of days, the app reminds you that you could give us another reading. And some people have given us many readings and, um, and she gave us more than one reading. That's uh, very useful to see. So um, on my webpage and on the project page, you find uh, two particular papers that um, which we um, we analyze this data and try to automatically um, detect um, some symptoms of the disease. Um, for the more computer science inclined, I have put here something that will, I will describe reasonably briefly, which is our architecture for detecting um, the the task of distinguishing positive positive users from COVID negative users. So we use the three inputs, cough, breathing, and voice. Um, we actually have used in this particular, we have tried various architecture for machine learning, but in this particular one, we have used a pre-trained model. Um, the model has been trained on a large data set of um, voices, uh, in fact, from YouTube. So it's audio from YouTube. Uh, but it, 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 it's because it's so large, it's, uh, it contains, it's able to capture features from our own spectrograms. And then um, we use those features to um, then do a classification using um, a, some, some uh, further connected layers. And uh, we use the softmax as a probability of, for the diagnostics of COVID or non-COVID uh, with respect to, of course, the ground truth. Uh, one last part that I will um, talk about a little later is the longitudinal study that we have. So the fact that they give us more than one, uh, which I think is very promising um, per se. So I, I don't like talking about uh, numbers, uh, but here is an indication of uh, one of our latest um, number set over a subset of the data we have, which we cleaned. Um, this is a, an English only data set. Uh, we had, um, you know, we have various, as you, as you heard, the woman speaking was actually Portuguese. Uh, we have various countries and various languages. And so it, it, it adds to the noise, it adds to the difficulties. This, this particular result was an, an English only, so a, sub, a smaller subset. The idea here is um, I, I, I'm particularly interested in sensitivity. So the ability to being able to spot a COVID positive um, among COVID negatives. So are we able to find all the positives? Um, so this, these are the results for those uh, who know what uh, this numbers means, but essentially it's the ability to um, really understand if someone is COVID positive, COVID negative. If you look at testing results um, of, uh, you know, this um, the lateral flow testing and, and things, so they also have um, some uh, false positives and false negatives, um, and uh, you know ev everyone makes mistakes. The advantages of this approach is, in fact, that you can repeat it many times. Uh, it doesn't matter uh, if you get one wrong. Nothing is sticking uh, something in your nose uh, to understand. Also, uh, what we are looking into is um, the test here is done on um, a balanced data set where we have 50% COVID positive and 50% COVID negatives. Obviously, in a population, you will have 10%, maybe even less, 5% COVID positive and the rest COVID negative. So we are looking at questions of prevalence. So can, can we try the model and see what the performance are when the prevalence is different? Can we test on other diseases? This, this is a question you probably have. How is a COVID cough different from a, a flu or cold cough? 
uh, we have tried, we have a small data set of uh, asthma, and it seems that we are able to distinguish asthma from COVID. Um, we unfortunately this year we had no um, no other diseases, no cold, uh, no flu, so we don't have a data set uh, for that. We've tried to use other data set for other diseases that have been collected in the past, but our machine learning was too smart. It would detect um, the type of data set rather than the disease. So if a data set was collected in a different environment with a different device, um, it, would, it was able to distinguish that. So we weren't able to use this data set, unfortunately, in collaboration with others. So this is a problem we still have. It's a very interesting problem. Um, one thing we have been doing, and uh, I've given another talk, and many people have asked about this, so I'll, I'll leave a, a little bit of time to describe it, is uh, the comparison with clinicians. We, we took about 25 samples blindly, and we gave them to um, physicians who have contacted us saying that they could hear COVID, they could hear a COVID call, they could hear a COVID, a COVID voice. And um, they gave us a score, uh, so any cough, any voice, uh, they gave us a score, and then we compared the score with the model. The result of our initial model was very interesting and showed that there is potential of things that the doctors seem to agree on, on something. So perhaps a couple of doctors were saying, oh, this is definitely COVID and it wasn't, and the model got it right. Or otherwise the model got it wrong and the doctors got it right. So I, I am, uh, I am a, an optimist and I hope that we'll come to a world where we can use uh, what is good of automatic analysis and what is good of human analysis and, and, and try to mix the two, try to use the models to help the clinicians. So that, that's one of the idea. I, it's not very well developed. It's okay for an afternoon and uh, dinner talk. The, um, the other aspect uh, that I've been hinting at is that the app asks the user to, um, comment, to, to come back to the app every couple of days to give, um, give, give, give samples. And this is the distribution of how many samples the users have given. As you can see, there are um, a, a few, less than 10 users uh, that have given us more than 200 samples. And although I don't know who these users are because it's all anonymous, I always thank them in my talks because uh, their, their data is very valuable. Uh, we have users uh, that have progressed into getting COVID. We have users who have progressed out of COVID and that data is um, super precious. Um, these graphs are a bit difficult to understand, but let's try with the top one only. Um, so this is a person that has tested positive for COVID on 13th of April, so that's why that line is red. Has tested positive for COVID a couple of days later, and again, you have a, um, a bar showing that it's, positive, it's, it's still red. And then the, the slightly red area is uh, when it's keeping us giving a sample, but um, is saying that the test was done a few days back. So probably on the 13th of April or the 16th of April. So that pink area refers to, I've been tested before, but this is my audio sample now. And um, as you can see in the, 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 the black line is the prediction of our model. And the prediction of our model is saying, um, yes, I agree that the prediction is that this person has COVID from the voice on the 13th of April. It's also saying the same on a few days later. And then you can start seeing that it's declining. The dashed line and the dotted line are when the, there are two different versions of the model. And yeah, I, I won't explain that, but um, you can see that the lines are declining, showing that the model is able to understand that the person is getting better. And to me, this, this is uh, very, very valuable. I'll skip the description of the last slide, uh, the, the last, um, part at the bottom, but it's a similar concept. So we've talked before about machine learning and, um, and clinicians and how they could perhaps live together. And the idea is that accuracy is often not enough. This is a paper that um, was using data images from um, our retina, our eye, and um, it was, detecting if um, the person had diabetic retinopathy automatically using machine learning. But it was also computing the uncertainty of the model. And if the uncertainty of the model, so if the model was saying, I'm not certain about this prediction, 
it would refer the difficult cases back to a clinician who could then look at them. So it would simplify the work of the clinician, not substitute the clinician. It would simplify the work because the simple cases could be done automatically, but then the most difficult cases where the model was uncertain were transferred back to something else. So we have tried something similar uh, for our model. And I think in the interest of time, I won't give you the details of this, but um, you can find this paper online, it's all published. And the idea essentially is the same. Um, we, we tried a version of the model that I have described before, but we looked at the standard deviation among the various versions of the model over a sample. And if the standard deviation is too high, we essentially say that the data needs to be is uncertain and so either needs to be referred to a clinician as you can see at the, at the extreme right or in the case of our particular application because the the application is low entry it's so cheap to get another sample we might ask the user to give us another audio sample to uh, improve the uncertainty of the estimation and that's definitely promising it's something that we've just started doing so i i don't stay i don't have much more to say about this um, but I thought it was interesting. Um, I will skip this other one and I will um, then um, continue by saying, in addition to COVID, we're, tried very, we're trying various things to use audio and a combination of systems and audio. This is a belt that one of my master students built last year is very rudimental, as you can see. The idea is that um, we, we are building things that can stay uh, near our body where we can do some sort of uh, analytics uh, on the sounds that we get automatically in our body. And of course, we're working on uh, the next generation platform, which uh, could be earable, and trying to understand if we can use in-ear microphones to um, understand something about our health and do it in a way that uh, makes make sense <laughs> and, and is useful. And so this is a project that we're doing in collaboration with Nokia Bell Labs, which is also in Cambridge. So I think I'm roughly coming up to the time that I was given. And um, I will say one final thing, which is uh, we're still collecting data and the website is uh, up there, covid-19-sounds.org. We are also distributing the data. So um, we, have, we, are not, we haven't managed to look at all the data, but the data we have looked at and we've processed and analyzed can be distributed because we have voices, the data is sensitive. And so the university is allowing us to share it with an agreement. So you need to write to us and we can share it for academic uh, purposes and um, you need to sign this uh, data sharing agreement. But uh, the idea is that it's all there. So for the moment, thank you very much. I will stop sharing and uh, then take your question. Well, Professor Mascolo, thank you very much indeed. That was absolutely smashing. Um, it, it needs to say I have great faith in um, doctors when you can get to see them. Uh, um, but even when, even when you can get to see them, um, sometimes you wonder if they've had a bad night the night before. Uh, and so it always seems to me jolly handy if you've got something which um, uh, doesn't indulge in partying uh, to get some kind of... Um, more analytical diagnosis um, and the kind of things you're doing, particularly when you can say, uh, we're not quite sure about this, let's ask the doctor, uh, seems to be uh, absolutely a direction of travel, not least because it uh, hugely improves the efficiency with which these things can be done and more doctors to go around. Well, look, that was absolutely wonderful, thank you. Um, can I remind people that you have the opportunity to raise your hand if you would like to be on the telly to ask your question. Uh, alternatively, you can come in by the Q&A where I will do my best to read out verbatim your question. Uh, and the only editing I will do is if there are two or three questions uh, that look the same. Um, so please uh, dig in and ask whatever questions you would like. Uh, and I'll try and uh, bring you in uh, as fairly as I can. Um, First of all, uh, we have a question from um, George Perandia. Um, can you distinguish uh, bronchitis or dust cough from COVID cough? So um, this is a, a very good question. Um, we 
have very limited data on what else, what other diseases and medical history people had in this data set. And um, so automatically the answer I have to give you for the kind of tests we have done is no. Um, I know that uh, doctors have been in touch with us saying that this disease seems to have very specific sounds that they think could be distinguished. Obviously, I think it's a very personal and um, another doctor was telling me how important, especially for voice, it is to get a, a sort of a baseline of how your voice is. So that's why I think this particular approach is very, very useful for progression. So, you know, you have a general model, but then you have a few sample from me of my voice when I'm healthy. And, and those are used to retrain the model, to train it better on me, on personalize it. And then it can be used to understand how my voice could be uh, worse uh, when, when I get a disease. Um, unfortunately, as I was saying, we tried to mix our data with other data sets, very few data sets that exist uh, that have been collected from uh, phones of other disease, COPDs and things. Unfortunately, our, our techniques were too smart to distinguish the data set rather than the disease. Um, so the, the answer I have to give you is no. I, I don't know if we can distinguish bronchitis dust cough. Thank you. And from um, uh, MV Bright, um, are your diagnostic methods, symptoms and signs significantly affected by age? That is a, another excellent question to which I have to say I have no idea. Um, we, we have age, we have symptoms. Uh, we've tried to mix the models with symptoms and audio. I don't know if, if you're, um, if, if that's what you're asking. Um, but I think age is yet another, I think to, to answer with the same line of answers I was giving to, the, to George, um, the, the personalization, the fact that perhaps your voice is different because of your age, um, would be useful. And so it might not just be personalized, but it could be perhaps trained on data of people that are of the same age group. That, that's a good idea. I haven't thought of this before. I'm thinking of that now. It, it just doesn't need to be your voice, but it could be a voice of someone, perhaps a smoker like you, or a person of a certain age, a woman. Um, we could use this to, to improve that. Thank you. Um, I see John Cook has his hand up. I would you like to uh, ask your question, Don? Uh, that, that was a, a fascinating... Oh, wait a moment. I'm echoing. Why am I echoing? I muted them. You're not echoing to me. Okay, I am to me. But I'll take these out. Me. There we go. Um, so you mentioned le leaving the diagnosis or doing the diagnosis on the device itself, on the on the earbuds or on the mobile phone. Um, let's say it, this became wildly successful and, and had a 99% success rate in diagnosing COVID or, or other, other diseases. Um, what, how would you anticipate that diagnosis being transmitted, let's say to the authorities or what happens to that diagnosis afterwards? Because what we've seen is is people taking um, tests, the nasal tests, and then if they're positive, they don't do anything about it because they're worried about the consequences. Not not surprisingly. So how do you uh, how do you see that being? Uh, this is a legal question, I guess, rather than a. I I was about to say this is by my pay grade, but um, the, I I will attempt a question. I think perhaps diagnosis can become a very private matter. Um, my idea is that whatever stays on your device stays on your device because it's, it needs to be important to you. Now, if there are layers of uh, further public health enforcement that say now that information is to go back to a centralized site, um, there is no di digital challenge in making that happen. It's okay. Um, I don't know if that would be the best way or... Um, you know, I think the reason why people are not telling the authorities is perhaps that um, if they have to quarantine, they are not earning money or, you know, that there are very many uh, reasons why people make those choices and, and some are beyond 
technology or um, biology. <laughs> so I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not answering, uh, but I, I see where you're going with it. Well, you I, I, it's a answer. tricky, a tricky question. I agree. Thank you very much for your answer. There is no technology um, obstacle in doing either keeping it to the person or uh, sending it somewhere. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I have a question from Margaret uh, Costry. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, um, which says, just checking on a slide that talked about results on prediction, you said English only. Uh, do you mean English speaking nations or England? <laughs> I can tell you what I mean, but it, it, it's a it's a very interesting question because um, we detect that the person um, is English by looking at what kind of language the app has been set up with. So we have we we, we allow the user to choose the language, and um, by the user choosing English, um, this could mean that. Um, they use English, they want to use English. Um, I, my app, for example, is set up in English and I'm originally Italian, so I will have a, a reasonably thick accent when I read that sentence in English. And we ha have all of that. This is the beauty of the crowdsourced data. This is what, if we want scalable uh, data, you, you need to work with this. Um, and, uh, and, and with all this noise and, and building models are robust against this. And we find, we already found it very difficult even just going beyond having the English proportion, the Italian proportion, uh, at some point the model was learning that because uh, during that period, the wave <clears throat> of Italian sick uh, was higher than the English, the model was very easily predicting based on the language saying, oh, I hear Italian, COVID positive. That's a prediction I'm giving. Um, so yeah, we need to be careful. Great, thank you. Now I can see Yuzu Yu on the screen. I don't know if you're ready to ask your question, Yuzu. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. I have um, two fairly basic questions. I'm uh, still a PhD student and I was wondering, um, uh, so I'm not that familiar and I'm trying to learn how to um, build a, a very good app. Um, would you have any advice on um, how we can learn to do that? And for example, do you have any suggestions on the platform like Amazon, Amazon Web Services or um, the Google one, the Firebase, if I'm not mistaken. Google Cloud? Yeah, Google Cloud. So in terms um, of uh, receiving your data? Uh, yeah, using like some sort of a platform to, to host the app. Um, do you have any advice or any pointers on where we can go um, to learn that? Uh, I mean, the, the, there, are, there are lots of uh, courses on uh, mobile app development. It, it's become very standardized somehow, um, but we had difficulty releasing, I mean, I guess I'll take the question a diff in a different direction. I, I, for hosting your app, um, either Amazon or Google would do, um, and we, we even have made our own server um, hosted by the department, in fact, to collect the data, which was easier for us. Um, the difficulties we had was uh, that um, Google and Amazon, uh, sorry, Google and Apple are really careful of, uh, on how research apps are released, even if we, you know, if you're aggressively, we were using the microphone, right, to collect people's voices. And so we had to, we were blocked by Google and um, Apple for a while because they thought we were uh, just collecting a large data set with the name, the app had COVID uh, on the name. And at the time, th there were lots of scams and things. So we had to go to the highest levels of the university to get a letter and then find a way to give this letter uh, back to Google uh, and Apple and say, this is, this is research. It, it, it's really trying to do something good here. Um, so there is no path to connect these companies to, to have this, especially for the app uh, markets, which are widely um, deployed. There should be better research um, app development paths with these companies and there aren't yet. It'd be good to see a bit of support on that. Um, you, you probably will find that when you have your app and you try to post if the app is doing anything like passive sensing of some, some sort of things that um, trying to understand behavior, it would probably push the wrong buttons with Apple and Google, quite rightly uh, push the wrong button with Apple and Google, but um, I think a conversation should be, should happen. That's, that's quite reassuring actually, isn't it? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, no, um, thank that, you. on one side. 
Um, can I go to uh, David Nugent's question? Um, uh, David writes, thank you for your fascinating presentation. Uh, please could you elaborate on the legal aspects of voice sample collection analysis and results dissemination along the supply chain? How does GDPR relate to voice-based diagnostics? My interest is in the diagnosis of depression and neurological degeneration using automated speech recognition. So the idea is that if I collect voice data and um, I anonymize, right? My, my data is anonymized, but then I take those samples and I correlate it um, with, I don't know if you're, you're familiar with the Netflix uh, challenge that happened some time ago. So I'll, I'll give the example of the voice and then we can talk back to that. But so I have my voice data and I, um, I then correlate it with YouTube voice data. And I find out that I have data that looks very similar to the voice of actor X on this YouTube video. And in, in addition to voice data, I also have medical history data of this person. Um, and so all of a sudden, I know the medical history of actor X. So voice is quite sensitive uh, because it has markers that are specific. My voice is different from yours. Uh, so you, you, you really need to be careful how you treat it. Um, and that's, 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 that's all there is. So we, are, uh, we have decided to distribute it with a very specific um, permission to other academics. So we are asking the academics to sign that they can get the voice data from us, but they won't do anything bad. And most importantly, they won't redistribute. Uh, they won't try to de-anonymize and their institution is signing for them that they will um, do this. Um, so I, I'm not sure I'm really answering um, all this aspect, legal aspect of voice sample collection and as and results. Um, dissemination along the supply chain. So results, um, I don't know if you mean, if I can detect COVID, I can give you the test. Let's say at the moment, I'm only collecting data and making models that are able to say, is a sample COVID positive or COVID negative? But what if I started giving you the result and say, okay, give me a sample. Two minutes later, I say, oh, you're COVID positive. Well, I that requires um, regulation because I then become a medical device. Um, I'm giving you a medical advice. So we haven't gone to, to that level of, uh, of preparation of our device yet. So uh, although people write to us and say, tell me, I've given you samples, I want to know what, what, what is my result. And my answer unfortunately has to be, I cannot yet. Um, I'm, I'm not doctorized. I cannot, I'm not clinical. I can't give you that result. Sorry, I don't know if I'm answering. Seem very clear, uh, and it is a nice segue to Desmond Chung's question, which is, uh, in your opinion, what are the biggest barriers to a technology developer uh, like yourselves uh, might face in order to turn this type of novel AI-based diagnostic models into marketable, regulatorily approved medical devices? Yeah, so there, there is a long path. Um, I haven't even tried to go. I think the first thing would be they will want me to do a clinical trial. They want me to. Um, do this with hospital so so have really proper COVID test uh, results instead of the person telling me I am COVID positive um, and that's one thing we're trying to add so having some of that data coming from somewhere where I can automatically recognize that the person has been really tested the real ground truth um, so I think that will be one step uh, but it, it's a long path actually before we can do that on, on this particular aspect. Yeah, and just a response back from um, uh, David Nugent. Uh, thank you, and saying uh, he was thinking more about how the technology would be used, for example, by the NHS. Um, I've seen attempts to collect similar data by the NHS, uh, by the way. So they, they are hooking up to the idea of the possibilities of such a tool. Um, and they have the ability to then have the real test linked to that. So um, we had a couple of conversations with them. Um, I, I don't know if they will go uh, very far for this disease because I think uh, perhaps this is much more useful for progression at this point. We have quite cheap um, testing already for, for COVID at the moment, but and the technology is, is, is probably not as ready as it should be, but yeah, maybe I'm being conservative. Um, now somebody um, enigmatically called KB 
uh, writes, uh, you mentioned about privacy and the solution to use a general model. Does the general model stop being representative because the new population diverges over time from your general model? Uh, so I think you can customize the general model. You can continue continue training the general model on some sample data, um, either um, centrally, maybe, you know, use a little cl continue clinical trial, continue side effect of collecting more data to adapt to new variants, adapt to new things, and then uh, customize on device, personalize. Uh, that's one way I can see. Uh, I'm not sure I'm answering, but yeah, maybe that way. Great, and the, the, we had a, a technical question uh, snuck in on the chat, but I seem to have lost it now. So if the person who sent it would like to send it in on the Q&A, uh, we'd be uh, pleased to answer it. Um, I, I have a question, if I may, Professor Maskell, and that is, it, where are these kind of um, issues discussed um, across the range of people who are doing this kind of automated diagnostic. It, it, we chatted briefly before we came on air uh, about the company Alstone, which is doing um, breath testing for uh, spotting early detection of cancers. Uh, this is obviously a hugely important area. Is there a community of people from different technological backgrounds who um, who are having these conversations, because clearly what one would like is a sort of comprehensive set of diagnostics where you can just put on your watch or whatever it is uh, and know how you're doing. I think that's a, a very general question. There are um, narrower groups of people. So for example, even ourselves, we try to organize a COVID related, audio COVID related workshop where everyone who was trying to do COVID analysis was coming together. This was in September last year. I had the link on my webpage for a while. I don't know if it's still there. Um, more generally, the, the machine learning and health community is trying to have conversations about how how do we go about keeping um, clinicians in the loop? Uncertainty is very much discussed. Causality is very much discussed. Um, I think there might even be um, groups talking about the different variety of sensors and how this can be integrated. I mean, I know there are, um, I just don't know if they are health specific. Certainly in my community, we talk about integration, multi-sensory integration um, of, of various sensors. Um, but uh, the more I talk to people, the more I realize there are other people doing similar things or related things. So I, it's, it's probably there isn't enough, maybe, is the answer. Well, I guess we're, we're lucky in, in Cambridge. Uh, there seem to be people with fingers in lots of pies. Perhaps there's a Cambridge community which uh, should talk to each other a bit more. Not that we are very good at that historically, although we're supposed to be. Um, thank you. I've got uh, a video question from uh, Bang Zhang Yong, a rather technical question, which he snuck in on the, uh, the chat, but we've now got him on the telly. So Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah I, I was uh, yeah, uh, thinking you might not get it uh, the, the, from, from the chat. I don't know. Uh, but anyways, um, this uh, presentation was really interesting to me um, because it strikes me uh, as a PhD student who's researching on um, uncertainty of machine learning on sensor systems. Um, so yeah, the first question would be, um, I was thinking if you would cast it as an uh, unsupervised anomaly detection maybe would be a better approach towards the imbalanced data set. Um, secondly, is the data set publicly available if I would like to work on it? Um, and thirdly, um, do you see other avenues of uh, uses cases for uncertainty in, uh, in your uh, research? Yeah. Uncertainty is one big thing that two or three of my students are looking at. Um, the paper you find on archive, uh, I don't know if you find it already, look at my name on archive. It's the one on April, you'll find uncertainty in the name and COVID. So that's the one I displayed before. Uh, there we use, uh, I'm going to be technical with you, we use, a, we use an ensemble model um, to use the unbalanced data and then look at the standard deviation with max pooling to, um, to look at the uncertainty, which was a, a very rough way of considering uncertainty, as you probably agree. Um, we have tried to use some um, GRU, some um, adversarial, 
but we're not that far with that. So um, yeah, it is a very interesting avenue. I agree with you. Uh, if you want to talk more, um, please send me an email. Uh, I think uh, this is very interesting for clinical. Uh, uncertainty is the key uh, for clinical integration. So keep going. Okay. Well, thank you. thank you for that. Um, thank you for the question. Thank you for the answers. Um, I think we should let you uh, escape, Professor Muscular. It's been an absolutely fascinating talk, uh, encouraging in so many ways, uh, and a lovely example of how um, some very solid uh, science and indeed technology uh, can be applied to very practical purpose uh, and indeed uh, in a very topical context. So um, thank you most warmly. Thank you for those of you who uh, have asked um, questions. And can I just remind you that in a couple of days, this will be uh, available on YouTube. Um, I look forward to seeing everybody next time. Thank you again, Professor Maskelow. Thanks for the invitation. Bye.